Hello there, Evie here, and hello again to Skillshare, who's sponsoring this video. And hello to G-Skill, who sent over the Enki 360 for me to do whatever I want with. Turns out I'm doing a review. As usual, only if you really want this, there are Amazon associate links in the video description. Please consider using them and supporting the channel. Cracking open the fancy box, we find some fancy but not very recyclable packaging, so keep it handy for selling the unit later on. Past the fancy packaging, we've got a few of those nine blade cooling fans, the accessories box, which we'll check out later, and the main feature, the pump and radiator unit. We'll tackle the main unit first, starting with the radiator, as the bullet points on the packaging and info in on the website suggests. This cooler has more radiator channels than other coolers, including, as I can confirm, the Corsair H150i Pro XT. As the famous saying goes, nothing in life is free, so the extra channels are at the cost of space for fins, so we'll have to see how that pans out later in the testing results. Speaking of the fins, I wanted to see what they were like close up, and it turns out there's some sort of split fin design, and this is a feature that's shared with other coolers like the Corsair H150i Pro XT. Moving on to the pump and base plate via the tubing sheath or sheathed tubing, well it's completely wrapped in plastic. Minus the plastic, this is a glossy little unit and apparently this is a new pump solution from G-Skill that doesn't use the same OEM that most other manufacturers use. I can't clarify what it is, but that's what I've been told. I'll say this much though, at full clap it's very quiet, so something's clearly working. Something that isn't working so well for me is the factory thermal paste application. It's a little dirty. So before installing the cooler I decided to remove the specks of what appeared to be black plastic. It's not the end of the world but it's a little disappointing and not what you expect. There are a couple of cables that trail from the pump unit. One is a 4 pin fan header, nice and standard, as is the ARGB 3 pin connector which you can also hook up to any board or any other 3 pin ARGB controller. Touching on the fans quickly, there's not a lot to say. They've got built in rubber pads to keep the vibration noise down and spin between 500 and 2100 RPM. You don't get any fancy ARGB lighting features with the fans, but you do get a solid braided cable with four pin connectors that's just over 35 centimeters long pretty lengthy uh, in terms of most fans. That's about it for these, good enough for a discreet look and can be enhanced with some lighting elements. All that's left before we install and test this thing is the parts box and manual. The quality of the hardware provided is excellent, nice and chunky steel plates and brackets, uh, but I'm not a fan of seeing any o-rings as small as this though, that seems like a pain in the ass for the poor sod who's got to fiddle around with those. And those poor sods appear to be... Uh nobody. Yeah, they're just in with everything else. They have no relation to in the install manual, no mention of them in the parts list either. And they're not double-sided sticky tape sort of stuff to hold the back plate on. They're, they're just sort of there. Speaking of the manual, it's small and concise as all manuals should be, but there's a verge thermal paste moment in the making here. You've got guidance to use thermal paste on your CPU before installing the block, but you've got pre-installed thermal paste on the cooler. Hopefully that doesn't catch out too many newcomers to this stuff. FYI, you only need one or the other, not both. On that note, it's really nice to see additional thermal paste included in addition to the pre-applied stuff. After retesting all the AIOs I've got to hand in preparation for this review, I got kicked in the nuts by Corsair since they didn't include a tube of thermal paste with their pre-applied paste. So the H150i Pro XT had to use MX4. But, G-Skill make a big show and dance about their thermal paste you get with the cooler and how it's server grade stuff. Now, are we talking about the blue stuff you get in the tube or the white stuff pre-applied to the cold plate? Yeah, we're dealing with two different thermal pastes. Are they both server grade? Are they similar in performance? Who knows? For the sake of this review, I'm going to be testing with the pre-applied place pre-applied paste since it's what most people are likely to use when they're getting this cooler. Anyway, I'm told there's more to life than talking about thermal paste, so let's get on with the installation. I'm mounting to an LJ1151 socket, so I'm using the included backplate which requires the four long posts and o-rings.
rings. I wouldn't go into this in too much detail normally, but I'm not completely happy with this mounting solution. A lot of room for improvement. For instance, because you roll the O-ring over the post, it can roll off since it's storing some tension. Now that's not terrible, but to add the arms, you need to add some spacers first. And since these spacers don't retain the position of the back plate by gripping onto the long posts, you need to keep one hand on the back plate to keep it in position. This means you can't lay the motherboard flat when it's in a case very easily or use one hand to hold the arm while the other secures it with a nut and due to the nature of the multi-socket compatible brackets these arms will always be unstable one will want to fall off of the post so you'll need to do a bit of a one-two process to make it work not terrible but a little awkward but then to install the cooler block you need to set it down onto the cpu which highlights a little clash with the arms which requires a little shimmy to get past and then you need to balance a couple of washers and then a couple of springs before driving a screw through the center of the screws and springs to secure the block down. So while the mounting hardware is solid and the thermal paste provided is good in terms of its application and the extra you get, the mounting system is flawed in many minor ways that make the, in the install uh, an inconvenience. Luckily it's something you have to do once, but good luck to installing this thing to a vertically mounted board without sending a washer into your power supply unit. Well, if you install your power supply unit fan side down, that won't be an issue anyway. The radiator is as simple as installing a radiator can be. You get washers and screws to secure it to your case and long screws to secure the fans to the radiator. No issues there whatsoever. So that's the system installed and hooking up the pump to an ARGB controller gives you a good idea of what the pump looks like lit up. You can control the pump lighting with any board with a three pin ARGB header and not being a massive fan of ARGB lighting personally, I think this is about as bright and flashy as I'd like to see it. It's subtle and well lit, pretty classy for an ARGB lighting setup. By the way, what the lights do in terms of effects and colours is purely based on what controller you're using. Now the overview is out of the way, let's cover performance. Like I said earlier, I've retested a pile of AIO coolers, so we've got a good cross-section of the kind of performance you can expect from, say, a cheaper aluminium fin 240mm AIO, like the Silverstone TDO2 ARGB, or TDO2 RGB, uh, and a more premium style 120mm AIO, like the Silverstone PF. 120, a high-end 360mm unit like the Corsair H150i Pro XT, and a super cheap 360mm AIO like the PC cooler something 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 Halo, which is like three times less expensive than the H150i, both being similarly sized, well, the same size kind of radiator. And it took a leak in its box while sitting idly on my shelf for a few months. Not much came out, but enough to notice. Maybe that's why we could, should consider a higher quality AIO from a brand we've actually heard of before if you're looking to go for one or, or just stick to air cooling to be on the safe side. Anyway, results time. In the lower power 55 watt average load of Fire Strike with the fans acoustically limited, the Enki 360 or 360 performed very well heading right onto the top of the list. It's very closely followed by the Scythe Mugen 5 and a couple of degrees behind it is the H150i Pro XT. Turning the power up to an average power wattage of 100 watts with priority 5, the Enki 360 is still ahead, followed by the Mugen 5 and the H150i as before. Something I found very interesting is the cheaper aluminium fin 240mm radiator didn't fare well at all compared to the large and mid-sized air coolers, and even lost pretty badly to the 120mm PF120 all-in-one liquid cooler from Silverstone. And the super cheap, albeit slightly leaky 360mm AIO wasn't a world behind the H150i Pro XT. So if you need an AIO and can deal with the stress of impending doom, not a bad option. In terms of the setup of those tests, the Enki 360 had its fan spinning at about 30%, which was around 1,085 RPM. Actually, it's interesting how the top four coolers all had their fans spinning at about 1,090 RPM. Just seemed to pan out that way, which is kind of strange. Now, a common criticism I get is the complexity of my graphs. If you want to know which is best, just look at the position of the results in the graph and the curve of the bars. But if you want to know why it's better or worse, paraphrasing the great philosopher Br Britney Spears, you've got to work the 
it's it's just a few more bars to look at. Moving on to the full fan speed testing, here the Enki 360 and H150i Pro XT are equal and the Mugen 5 trails a little behind. The cheaper aluminium fin 240mm AIO overtakes the smaller 120mm premium option being the PF120, turns out brute force can solve certain problems. Pushing the load up to 100 watts on average with Pro 5 a small amount of separation appears in the Enki 360's favour and the Mugen 5 is performing relatively closer to the top AIOs. And for some reason the 165mm MA610P is performing worse than a 125mm tall NHU9S. Maybe that's down to a Noctua thing, they just seem to nail cooling products, or maybe it's down to a little brute force considering the U9S's fans were pushing past 2000 RPM where the AM610Ps were closer to 1500 RPM. While we're here, it's worth noting that at full fan speed, the three fans of the Enki 360 were noticeably quieter than the three faster fans of the H150i Pro XT. So perhaps that whole increased radiator tube density thing has actually paid off. Which actually brings us onto the money side of things quite nicely. So if you can get your hands on one, they don't seem to be in stock much at the time of recording this video, you should be paying around $180, 180 euros or 170 pounds but I, I can't really confirm the UK pricing at this stage, that's just a guess based on the European and US pricing. That's more than the H150i Pro XT, which means when we combine the cost with the acoustically normalized test results, the lighter numbers being the cost versus priority 5 testing, and the darker ones being the cost versus fire strike testing, you can see either way you cut it, the H150i Pro XT is the better value from a performance standpoint. But let's deal with the elephant in the room, or elephants in the room first. By a long shot, the Scythe Mugen 5 is the highest value cooler on the board. It's comparable to the highest performing air coolers on the market like the Noctua D15S and Dark Rock 4, and for the performance on offer, it's dirt cheap. Is it the best option if you're using a Threadripper or Extreme Edition CPU? Perhaps not, but if you're only cranking out about 100 watts, heck anything up to 150 watts most likely, you really don't need to be caught up in the whole high cost AIO situation. The air cooling option will perform just as well and is more likely to be more reliable than any AIO option on the table, which is something I value when it comes to spending a significant amount of money on a fragile piece of equipment. Speaking of which, you don't need to spend much to better equip your fragile piece of equipment, your brain. Thanks to Skillshare who's sponsoring this video, you can fill your curious mind with well curated sources of knowledge. Since the last video, I've watched the whole video on a budget course by Christopher Rhodes, which has a whole Whole host of tips and tricks to compose on-site shoots. The productivity for creatives class by Thomas Frank to better help my whole operation here to get a little bit more organized and I just discovered a DIY backdrops class by Tabitha Park so don't be surprised if things get a little bit more interesting in the blurry background of future videos. Along with the curated aspect of Skillshare, the ability to listen to the classes without having the screen or your phone screen always on in the background is great and the lack of ad stepping in the way stops your mind being saturated with unhelpful information from those ads when you're opening your mind up to discover and learn new skills. If any of that takes your fancy then it's less than $10 per month with an annual subscription and the first 1000 of my subscribers to click the link in the video description will get a free trial of premium membership. So a big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and a massive thanks to my patrons over on Patreon. I really hope you're enjoying the weekly updates which are full of development and production details over the previous week uh, on the channel. If you want to support the creation of content like this, please consider joining the Patreon, subscribing, liking and sharing the video and letting me know in the comments what stuff that's coming out soon you'd like to see on the channel. Anyway, thanks a lot for checking this stuff out and I'll catch you in the next one.